Welcome to the LaunchPod, a product management podcast from LogRocket. Today, our guest is Nancy Wang, Senior Vice President of Product Operations at Hilton Grand Vacations, a market leader in the vacation owner industry, where she has been for over a year now. Before that, Nancy spent the last decade of her career working at Alert Logic, a comprehensive cybersecurity portfolio now owned by Fortra, beginning as a lead system engineer. Nancy worked her way up to principal engineer before taking on product management responsibilities and ultimately becoming the vice president of technical product management. In her tenure, Nancy led the Alert Logic MDR product scale from 0 to 8 million MRR within two years. On today's episode, LogRocket's VP of Marketing, Jeff Wharton, talks to Nancy about how she leveraged her engineering background to excel in product roles her strategic approach to building and leading a comprehensive product operations team at HGV, and the importance of planning, transformation, open-mindedness in acquisitions, and continual improvement. So here it is, our conversation with Nancy Wang. All right, Nancy, so excited to have you on today. I've been waiting for this one. I'm looking forward to this. You started in engineering, you moved into product over time. Can you talk about that journey maybe a little bit and, and how you kind of came to be in product from that background? Sure, sure. So I often talk to, you know, either to my team or when I do an intro, I talk my about my career journey. It's pretty interesting. I definitely started in the engineering field. I first obviously got my uh, graduate degree in computer science, so very different compared to what I'm doing now. But as I was entering the workforce, I started in the, a wind energy company. I was in their R&D and, you know, I was basically the only person who is not from aerodynamic background. Everybody else working in that R&D center, they were all, you know, either from Boeing or like some, some, you know, wind energy company. So throughout my career, if I, if I look back, I think the, the key thing to, to, to kind of think through is almost every job that I had, I, I ended up doing something different. So as I was working in that wind energy R&D facility, uh, they had a need, you know, when I was hired on, I was doing the, basically as a performance simulation engineer. So I was, you know, helping them to run their large turbine simulation model on a HPC cluster. And then we had a need of needing a HPC lab for the R&D center. And then we were, I remember we were in a downtown building. This is 22nd floor in Houston, downtown building. And there's no, no setup, you know, the building facility AC is not set up that way. So it was a lot of interesting challenges and, and you know, things to, to learn to basically find out what does it need? What do you, what do you need in order to have like a little, pre, pretty much like a little data center set up? So throughout the experience, I learned a lot about, you know, the HPC computer setup, the networking gear, the storage gear, as well as like worked through a lot of hurdles within the building. So eventually had a very nice looking like glass door kind of HPC lab in the downtown building. So that was a fun experience. And then kind of that continued on through my career journey Then I went to banking, worked for JP Morgan for uh, a couple of years and really learned a, a lot about various different systems. So I was in their, you know, core kind of Unix uh, team there. And then the, where I started pivoting to product is really my previous place. So I, I worked in a cybersecurity company called Alert Logic for about 11 years. Where I started there uh, was also on the infrastructure engineering side, was really helping them to look at what are some better ways to, to make sure our um, the, the, the highly scalable uh, processing platform can run more efficiently. As throughout that process, I went through like a hyper growth period of the company where we went from like less than 2000 companies slash customers worldwide to about 4,000 in a matter of a year. So we had the need of growing the data center again from like two to seven within that kind of year and some horizon. So again, a lot of involvement in the, you know, choosing the best kind of platform system like servers and as well as the storage so that because it's our bread and butter we need to be able to process and store the customer's data in a very cost effective manner so did that and kind of let let the the growth for the uh, data center side and then around seven eight years ago 
as we saw the overall market and industry is actually pivoting quite heavily to uh, the cloud. Uh, that's when the it, it rests are booming and Azure and so on and so forth. So we made a strategic decision to basically build a new product in the cloud, cloud native, so, so that we can better support the cloud customers. So a lot of uh, heavy involvement, again, in the initial architecture choice of the infrastructure setup, because it's it's very different, although the need, the requirement is, is about the same, but when we move to the cloud, everything is very different. So that that was a point when I was almost like, throughout, again, throughout all of these, it's always someone ask, hey, you've done well in, a, in this particular effort in the past, can you help us on the on this other side? So I led the, essentially, we, we call it, you know, the replatform and feature parity effort for the, for the new uh, cloud native product. So we built our product, launched it, and then, you know, I was essentially leading the product effort to make sure that we are looking at the the products that we had, which was, you know, accumulated really over the last decade, two decades, uh, you know, all the feature functionality and how to like move the customers in a very effective way to the new uh, cloud needed product. So, so that was kind of my journey. That's that's where I ended uh, in the product uh, team, and then. Uh, I was leading the uh, product team for Alert Logic for about five years uh, before I moved on to HEV. Wind turbines, finance, timeshare, and and property in, in wonderful, beautiful places. It it makes complete sense, right? <laughs> well, I mean, I guess you think about it, right? There's wind in in beautiful tropical places with timeshares. There's you need money to go there, so I like it. I think it's a good story. It is like you said, it's the common theme kind of throughout that. You took on new challenges. You focused on making things better, and and it wasn't just engineering. Is how do you make the overall you know thing you were working on perform better as a system? Which is such a such a common background I think we see in product people is they may come from disparate you know really really when you get in the nitty gritty disparate focuses, but the big picture is always they looked at the whole system and how do you deliver the best end result, not just how do you do the task or something like that. Yeah, yeah, problem solving different areas, right? And so it's something we've definitely noticed, I feel like looking at, you know, multiple different product, product leaders I've talked to is sometimes people come from an engineering background, sometimes people come from all sorts of disparate other backgrounds. You know, the thing when you and I went to school is you couldn't go to school for product. So everyone kind of came to it from a different way. Maybe people who are looking to advance their career, would you recommend they get engineering experience? Like, is that necessary to really move forward? Or do you think it's a big step up or, or do you think it's kind of a nice to have? Like, how do you look at that? Yeah. So when I look at my kind of my product journey and my engineering background, I think personally it did help me. The The, the reason I'm thinking through, like at least the product uh, groups and companies I worked for, and I'm thinking about like thinking through the overall industry, I think it's very hard to find any kind of um, vertical nowadays that don't have to deal with technology in certain ways. So almost always that the product that we are working on, not, not saying all the time, but at least in my experience and very common in the industry, the, the product that we're working on is some have something to do with technology. So having the engineering background and understanding kind of how the sausage is made <laughs> per se, I think it does help, you know, in both ways, like in the way when I talk to the customers about like their needs, I can better exp better explain kind of how the, you know, the product was built and how the technology kind of work. And a lot of times the customers do appreciate that and, it, you know, helps helps them better understand and better kind of ask uh, what, what their, their needs to be in a, in a different way. And then talking to engineering has also helped me to translate what the customer wants in what the terms engineering really understand. But in terms of do I think it's necessary? I don't think it's necessary. You know, it, it would be nice to have. However, I've also seen a lot of success in different folks from different experience coming to product, right? So, you know, I've seen, you know, people in product management roles, they might came from sales. So in the, you know, sales or customer success in those kind of really, in those kind of roles, in their previous experience, what they're really good at is kind of the, the people side of it, the relationship side of it. So they make the customers really comfortable. It's like half of the battle in terms of product, right? A lot of times when the frustrated customer come to us with either feature enhancement or ask, the 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 folks who had the sales or customer success type of experience, they're e 
it's easier for them to kind of very quickly to put the customers in a you know comfortable place to actually come calm, calm, in a calm way to share like their frustrations with us or their their wants and needs with us from a product perspective. And I've also seen you know folks from for example in used user experience their their pr previous role was like a UX designer and then they moved to product. In those kind of experience, I think it helps them as a product person to very quickly kind of draft up some some mock-up design around the product features to very quickly, you know, obviously we can always go to the UX engineering team themselves, but as a product person having that experience, they can very quickly reduce that turnaround time and, you know, being able to almost like do a brainstorming uh, session with a customer to show, okay, is this really what you want it? Because a lot of times kind of things lost in translation a little bit. So I do think product is a very unique role and a lot of different experience people get from their previous roles would end up being helpful for what they're doing in in product. So it's, you know, it's it's it could vary. Yeah, I mean it's funny you kind of mentioned that technology now touches seemingly every vertical in every area, right? I know, I mean, yeah. I know personally if you look at our customer list, it it's all the, you know, tech companies you expect, but also you know, things that touch into waste removal, restaurants, like all the yeah. kind of companies you would think of as as brick and mortar and concrete as possible. And they have huge tech stacks and yeah. are, you know, really, really tech enabled. So it totally makes sense that being able to speak that language and, and build the stuff that enables. I mean, even I mean, even HGV over there, you guys, I know your team covers not just one kind of stakeholder say customer set, but you know, when we talked earlier, you described a really complex Flex built out product team that has multiple stakeholders, customer sets. Yeah. Maybe that's a great place to go, actually. You know, your team, when we talked about it, was super interesting. And, you know, I think you guys use the term product operations, which is really, really different from what we've seen, kind of what I've seen historically product operations yeah. described yeah. as, right? So that you... that part I learned talking to you as well. It's just, yeah. it's finding <laughs> too. Yeah. <laughs> Can you can we dive into this? Because I I love this thing. I think this is something that's really interesting. Is how is your team set up here? And I have some questions for after, but I, I'd love to. Just, can we explain to people like how your team set up and and what that looks like and kind of how it came to be? Sure, sure. So my cool. team, you know, my role, I'm the SVP for product operations for HUV Technology Team. So we definitely report up under the CTO, and it's you know the previous team. A little over a year ago was not a technology team. It was more referred to as a uh, IT organization. So the previous leader is a CIO. So in terms of the current setup, it, it, it's 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 interesting as we were talking and you were describing to me like more in, in, in most of the cases, folks under the product ops, they normally are, you know, the, the kind of the KPI team within the product management. But if I'm, I were to describe my team, I think the high level is that my team is responsible for the overall, you know, planning, implementation, execution, and launch of the all of everything related to HEV technology uh, roadmap. So obviously, we're not responsible for corporate applications or support, but everything else from you know, in terms of doing a new tech stack, a new software solution, or doing some enhancement to our existing tech stack, that's all kind of run through the planning side, run through in my in my team. And then obviously we partner with the engineering team really closely. So we, we don't code, the engineering team do the, all the coding and kind of architecture, but everything else kind of product, product roles sits within my, my group. And then when I talk about the setup, right? So I'll go through kind of the setup uh, of the team organization, and then I'll kind of go through the reasoning a little bit. So the team starts with a product strategy team. The pr previous uh, name of the team is a uh, business relationship manager. So this is a team who, like you described, we have many, many different groups of stakeholders. So there are <clears throat> teams who are responsible for like marketing. There are teams who are responsible for sales, for resort operations, for like the loan servicing part, for the finance part for membership, you know, membership and club part of the organization. So that team really sits very closely with the business teams and leaders to understand essentially what, what is their needs and what is their business problem they're trying to solve in their unique kind of work workflow. And it largely also kind of uh, echoes back to our overall tech stack distribution, right? So when, when we look at our technology uh, stack as a whole, I think roughly 70% of the tech stack is actually uh, used by internal team members. 
And then about 30%, even though we have like 700,000 members, only about 30% of the overall tech stack is directly customer facing. You know, obviously we have the, the member website, we have the mobile applications where the members use on a day in day out basis. They're, they're you know, managing their membership, they're managing their points, they're uh, booking their upcoming reservations and managing their, their reservations and so on and so forth. But then echoing back to that product strategy team, we have teams who need to decide who are the best customers to, to, to target a market, right? So that's the marketing organization. So they, ha they have a pretty unique stack of the Mar MarTech stack that they need to use. They need to score the, the, mem the members. They, they need to know what campaign that we have uh, targeted for a certain group of members. And then that, you know, after the prospect phase, then we move to the sales kind of realm. The, the, the members or the prospects come to the sales centers. You have the sales executives who use another kind of very different tech stack. They need to have a, a pretty slick a look and feel display at like a desktop view where, where the account managers can or the account executives very quickly show the nice resource and the products that we have to the members so that we can kind of build that what potential uh, vacation ownership the, mem the customers would want to buy. And after the prospects is happy and move to kind of the uh, purchasing phase, then we have a whole stack around the, you know, the contract generation, the building the quote and running the credit check type of software, which is, you know, doesn't need to be as slick from a look and feel, but it needs to be very effective, right? It need to pull all the, all the credit systems, the loan systems, and we, 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 we have that kind of setup. And then we, we have the call center and club agents who need to be on the call with the with the members after they become members. So they they need to manage the member de member membership detail. They need to see all the kind of you know reservations and so on and so forth. So that's like another tech tech stack. And then you have we have like 200 plus resorts worldwide. All of those resorts need to use some sort of system to serve the, the members. So all of these tech stack, although they're not directly client facing, right? The client don't kind of put their fingers on them, but having a very good customer experience and for our team members affects directly to kind of what kind of a customer experience that we have overall. So the product strategy team really sits with all of all of these internal uh, teams and business stakeholders understand their, their unique user experience ask and their unique kind of uh, workflow and business problems we need to solve for. Uh, and then we have the product management team, which really didn't exist uh, before I joined the team. Uh, we used to just have the business relationship management team, and then they would get asked directly from the business teams. And they would, because they're so heavily using the internal te uh, tech stack, they'll be asking, all right, I need this, this button here. I need this functionality added here. And then there wasn't a, a process or wasn't a product lifecycle back then to really ask the question, all right, why are you trying to do this? Like, what are you, what problem are you trying to solve? Because as you know, being in product, in a lot of cases, folks are using the functionality, they are um, interacting day in, day out, but that particular feature may or may not be what they really should be using. So we, after the product strategy team, we, we then build the product management team, really just doing, you know, your traditional kind of technical product management, really understanding what, like, now that we have the business problem, how should we sol solve for it? And, you know, work with architecture, UX to, to build the potential solutions, and then we vet with the stakeholders. So that team is responsible for the, you know, higher level releases and features and planning and, you know, tracking of the overall technical roadmap. And then after that team, there is the product owner team who then sits more closely with the engineering team, the, basically the scrum team within within the engineering team. And then they, they are more looking at how do I break these features down to sizable user stories so the engineering can actually uh, solve for them and ensure the end-to-end -end kind of feature and releases are, are really being built, right? After that team, there is the what I now call release management team. Previously, the team is called PMO, essentially. But as you know, the name change, a lot of these name changes are are really part of changing the way how folks used to think and operate. So release management team is tracking the overall, you know, project lifecycle, 
Scrum Master assists within that team too to make sure the the right kind of SDLC and Scrum ceremonies are are run, uh, project are tracked, and you know budget are tracked, and and ensure the overall kind of launch timeline is time launch timeline as well as activities are planned. And then after that team, um, there is product implementation team. So product implement implementation team really consists of folks who are implementation engineers. What they do is, you know, we have like sales centers, we have resorts. We do need to roll out some big changes or a new version of software. A lot of times you really need to think through how do, how do we schedule kind of those rollout and really be able to train those, you know, sales executives as well as the resort operation staff. How, how exactly, how should they use the, the new software? Because, you know, they... They sit at the desk, they're dealing with the customers right at that moment. You can't afford for them to kind of learning a new software on the spot. So we really need to make sure uh, the new application we build is well understood uh, by all the all the internal team members. Uh, the, t the documentation team sits within that, that as well. You know, the knowledge base kind of goes along with the training uh, and implementation. Uh, lastly, I've also recently added a product marketing <laughs> Function within the within the organization as well. Really looking across because we have so many initiatives going on. A lot of times the team is heads down making sure the execution is done, but really being able to articulate the value of the technology evolution, both with internal as well as with our, with our external customers, are, is super uh, important. So that is you know that's a, it's a kind of a quite a long spill about the team but that really is the the you know construct of the product operations team within HEB. yeah no i love the detail you can go into here because you know you really understand each piece and why it's there and i think that's that's the cool part here is it's thought out but it's thought out end to end back to you know we talked about at the beginning product management is ultimately just solving problems yeah, uh, but you've looked at it in such a complete way to to go from you know kind of the previous iteration at HEV, which is very like plan, build, run, right. to looking at what's the vision, how do we operationalize, it, how we make sure people understand what that looks like as they build through. But even I love the piece about having product marketing at the end because in the end you launch something and people don't know why it's there why? or yeah. what it's supposed to do. Then you know you just launched a piece of shelfware potentially. So I love the the follow through all the way to completion. And also the the release engineers, I think you you called them that you know kind of make sure everything's going out and how do you roll yeah. it out technologically and it's really thought through to the end user. It shows a great view on that kind of how do you deliver something to the end user and, and make it drive value. Humorously, I also just love that you have a product operations function. What you know most people would consider a traditional product ops uh, function inside your you know. Product ops yeah. team. Yeah. <laughs> product ops within product ops. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's like product ops squared there. So yeah. I, I do want to I want to put a poll up and and see what people would call your your meta org here because yeah is, yeah I'm encompasses curious, so too. much yeah yeah. So we're gonna we'll, we'll throw that up for sure. Yeah, it's because it's essentially it's the end to end cycle where the pieces yeah. are all needed for product management. But then if you call it product management, then people also have different perception about what product management right. is. So it's, it's, you know, it's really like the end-to-end -end operations within product, within product management. Exactly. No, I, I really, really can enjoy the, I, I respect the completion of the vision of, of the team there. I think it's, I'm sure, kind of a testament to how you guys are able to deliver so much and have transformed the kind of focus of the team. And with mm -hmm. that, I think that, you know, great jump off to, We've alluded to it, but you did kind of start out. You mentioned the product team started out in the IT org and, and really was just part of the IT team. And I think it was a very functional, like you said, build, you know, plan, build, run model. Right. There wasn't, right. you know, everything wasn't thought out. You know, you thought out what you needed to do, but it sounds like, you know, there was often a lot of kind of scope creep as, as features kind of came to be delivered. Right. Can we talk a little bit about, you know, the evolution there and how you kind of came in and, and were a part of this change over the past bit of time? Yeah, of course. I think it's, you know, it's actually, if we talk about the team setup and how the team was run previously, it's not that different compared to the rest of the folks in the industry, right? When I look at, when I talk to people within the industry, everybody pretty much is set up very similarly. And when, I, when I'm thinking about why, I think um, a lot in a lot of these cases, the, the vacation ownership industry, the timeshare industry as a whole, 
kind of grow gradually, that, right? They grow gradually. So a lot of times the IT or technology team is more like a, you know, keep your lights on, make sure, you know, certain feature enhancement is done. A lot of times the tech stack used by the vacation ownership industry as a whole is pretty probably built a little while ago because it works, you know, it's kind of these, these, these functional teams that these business units serve their needs, they just build onto it. So in a, across the entire industry, it's, it's pretty much all set up that way. And then up until probably a year or two ago, I think it, it works fine, right? Because you don't, you know, the company as a whole is pretty stable. As I said, like whenever we have growth, it's pretty, it's kind of a gradual growth. So it works. But what kind of triggered the need and what uh, changed the way how we operate is like HEV as a company, we essentially tripled the size in the last four years. So we both grew organically with our customer acquisition, our new member growth, as well as we acquired Diamond Resorts back in 2021. So we, you know, Diamond is not as big as HEV, but about the same size. So it's not that much smaller. So you essentially double the company back in 2021. And then similar, it, again, like in the vacation ownership industry, similarly, every company has a kind of a similar setup, even though technology stack is different, but it serves all of these needs like marketing, you know, sales, contracting, loan servicing, resort operations, member services, and all of like the entire stack have to serve these needs. So not only the, the company grew, the revenue grew, the, the team member size grew, the technology stack also at least doubled, right? You have all these different pieces to look at. And then January of this year, we acquired a blue green vacation. So not as big as the previous acquisition, but very decent size uh, vacation ownership company as, as well. So, and then our member rate, our kind of organic max member rate could grow significantly over the years too. So essentially more, almost more than tripled the company's revenue and size. So mm -hmm. what, not only technology stack, like now you have, essentially you have one of the vertical, which was very complex, so many pieces. Now you have three three different stack. So the the traditional way of the plan, build, run model in, you know, when we were chatting and you were talking about like the, like scope creep and things that we don't realize happens way more often now because there's so much complexity when the, within the technology stack hol holistically. It's very hard for the business teams and the users of the system to really understand what are the upstream downstream implication for their pieces to work alongside of with all the other pieces. And that also like the technology stack and product as a whole need to really be built as a, with a future a future facing vision so that we can we can support the uh, the partnership growth and future growth of the company in a very a robust and holistic way. So, so that really triggered the the drive from a plan built run to more. Okay, let's let's think about the holistic vision of the technology stack. What do we need to build? And then when when there's a specific needs within each of the business units, we can ask the question and then solve for it in a more effective way. And maybe we build one solution that will solve for like let's say five of the different teams' needs. So, so that was really what's triggered the the change within the transformation within a team. Yeah. And that makes sense, right? Because it may seem like I know, or rather, when I've talked to teams that have made this journey before, one of the big kind of things that, that you know, stakeholders were worried about was the engineering team often came in and, and pushed back that it's going to slow their velocity. They're not going to be able to, you know, accomplish maybe the same number of points, or if the product team is kind of doing all this kind of fact finding and understanding beforehand, they're not mm. going to have the velocity of, of roadmap to work on. In reality, I think what you typically see is in a less planned out environment, yeah, maybe the ticket velocity is a little faster at the beginning, but uh, I think you alluded to this before. What happens is you kind of get to close to delivery and all of a sudden you find out, hey, we only have solved these three other problems we're touching. We really need to do all that too. And suddenly your you know, five point ticket maybe balloons to 15 and you're late by two months delivering it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or, instance, yeah. yeah. Yeah, or the changes that you you wrote out actually have some upstream downstream implication that right. you 
completely didn't think through. And then that a lot of cases re- basically end up in reworking. So yeah, like you said, the right. take a speed is is faster if engineering just go at it, uh, you know, solving for the individual problem. But but we're we're overlooking a lot of times the rework that has to happen. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's rework, there's debt you're building potentially, and so this kind of holistic view. I have never run into a team yet that has found that a year or two down the road, they've actually accomplished more as a result and delivered more value. So I'd love to yeah. see it. When you're looking at that, right? You, I mean, you didn't have a small team coming into this change. Luckily, it sounds like I know from talking before, you know, and again, that's something we've seen in a lot of companies. It wasn't just you pushing for this, right? It was, was it the, yeah. the CIO? Yeah, and not, not the CTO. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, CTO and, and the engineering counterpart were all kind of on board with this vision. But even with that, you know, sometimes I guess, how did, how did it work for your team? You know, did you find that it was just a matter of enabling people and, and giving them, you know, responsibility and room to go? Or did you have to find you had to work with certain people to kind of build them up or change processes? How'd that change management work? Or how'd you kind of people driven towards this? Yeah, I think it's kind of the combination of all the aspects that you, you talked about, right? So first, not even you know, it it didn't stop at the CTO level. So mm-hmm. even before bringing on the the new CTO, because the previous CEO retired and he was here for about 16 years, long time, right? So the team was was right in a very, you know, plan built run model for a very long time. But then the executive leader, executive leadership team as a whole realized that because of the company's growth, because the technology complexity grows tripled, we need to look at the overall problem space very differently. So, so that they, you know, made the strategic decision to bring on my CTO on board. So that's the start of it, right? The CTO came on board back in January. I came on board in, in March, and our new uh, head of engineering also came on board in March. And luckily, all three of us came from a very kind of similar background where we Mm -hmm. saw the success within a uh, product-forward organization, product-led organization. So the the highest level alignment is there, and and we got the the overall executive leadership support. So that that was definitely uh, very, very crucial from the beginning. In terms of transformation for the team, like you said, yeah, the team is very much you know, it's it. We have we're a big company. We have a lot of things on an operational level, day in day out. We need to keep going. We need to keep kind of driving the feature sets to deliver the the value for our internal team members to drive future revenue as well as for our customers, right? Because it's a again big company, big team. So when I think back, the transformation and. and I would like to normally think transformation doesn't stop. Like, I think we're still in the middle of it. We're still constantly looking at ways that we can improve and, uh, you know, transform the team even further. But looking back from a year ago to now, really roughly, uh, uh, roughly a year ago, we started this is we, we did both. So first we grabbed the key kind of leadership, thought leaders within the organization. We, this is across not only within the product engineering team, across all of the team, like corporate applications, support, so all, all of my peers and their key leadership, we we got everybody together and we went through a programmatic product management training to really kind of hone in on the concept of what, what does product management really mean? Like when we think about and talk, talk through the product management life cycle, you know, it starts from concept to alpha to beta to GA to launch. You know, these concepts, it was was crucial to go for everyone to go through kind of the same training course. And then we we align on the uh, same term- terminology and thinking process. And at, at the back of that, after the training, we also did a couple of days of like brainstorming and really plan out the what we call the mind map. Like what are the, the things that we actually need to build because we know we're taking on this digital transformation journey of our technology stack. We need to both consolidate it as well as build it for the forward uh, needs and really provide the the best in, best in class experience for all of our uh, customers, you know, uh, integrate with modern AI technology and machine learning and recommendation and all of that to the members. We plan and all kind of brainstorm around the, the overall mind map and the blueprint for the technology team. So that was really critical up front. And then throughout the year, right, it's like the, the the standardizing on the process as well. Like after the first, you know, alignment on the concept, we then, I wrote out the 
a standardized product management tool, uh, also kind of mapped its connects with the uh, development uh, software that we use. So it's like product and uh, engineering software is completely in sync. And we have a very cohesive like view of what is product priority and what is the engineering teams working on. So, and then as part of that, as part of rolling out the standardized tooling, we also standardize kind of the rituals and the meetings, the scrum of scrums and, you know, the stakeholder sign off, like the, the, these, these product ritual meetings are standardized across the board as well. So it's like throughout, that's how we transformed the organization. And then along the, the, along the way, like I mentioned previously, we didn't have any product management team. We had one. I grabbed one that was really working in a product management compa capacity. I, you know, got her on the on board and on the team. But the, some of the other folks we have we had to hire, especially like folks like user experience. You do need to kind of folks who had that previous experience and that bring into the organization. So combining having new folks as well as like transforming the existing team and then really collaborating as a holistic team. That was what kind of contributed to the success of the organization transformation. Makes sense. I love, you know, I think people often overlook the rituals. Um, that's an easy piece to kind of think, oh, it's not important, but it's that piece of kind of regularity and coming together and yeah. making sure everyone understands the vision. And the I have found, I think early in my career as a leader, I kind of eschewed and, and stayed away from and thought they were a little hokey or a little kind of just, you know, no one wants to hear me repeat the same stuff again and again. But you come to realize just when you're getting tired of saying something is probably when people are really starting to hear it. And that's right. The regularity and the repetition helps people kind of stay on. But the other thing is is artifacts, right? And you know, we've had a bunch of great people on the this podcast who have talked about, you know, whether it's Carla Fisk who's over at Tebra and she talks about literally a product placemat that mm -hmm. she got from a, a colleague of hers over at Target or yeah. Sarah Owen from One Inc. has they've developed this thing they call a magic mountain, which is it's it's all simple. Like the best of these are so simple. It's a picture of a mountain with the top North Star gold and it cascades down and breaks up into sub goals and how they all drop yeah. up. But the the thing they all have in common is it's a simple way to communicate, you know, you have one or two big complex goals. How does everyone's individual piece ladder up? And I think that's an easy thing to lose when you move from the plan build run. Right. Plan build run, you you tell someone do this thing, they live in their little yeah. article slice and they yeah. always know what's going on up and down but this is you know more complex but the end result can be a lot better so do you do you folks over at hdv have any artifacts like that or anything like that yeah we we do it's i think it's both in an artifact as well as also just you know a constant kind of r ritual and uh like you said reiterate uh from the strategy down to the the pieces everybody is working on so we we have um we have a tour, you know, artifact that we call mind map. So yep. that's the, the mind map that we built from a year ago. And then we actually used this in my previous company as well. So as we were doing the, you know, replatforming for the product, we build the mind map. And it's, it's again, like a couple of days, probably a week or two brainstorming sessions and with folks who really understood the, the complexity and the features for the uh, technology stack that we had or product mm -hmm. stack that we had build out throughout the two decades. And then we know what we need to build in the new new platform, new product in order to, you know, really fulfill the vision. So it's think of it as, as like a color coded tree almost like. And then as as we were building the feature set and uh, as we were launching the releases, it was very fulfilling as I was leaving, looking back, almost I would say 90% of the bubbles of the mind maps are all lit up. So, and, and that's, that's essentially kind of what we're following here too, because we, we know the big pieces that we need to build, but then each of the bubbles actually takes time to build, you know, to build, and act, uh, to build and develop and, you know, mature and make well. So when the team, when we talk to the team, we often refer back to the mind map and say, Hey, this is kind of what we're building holistically and how this is contributing to the overall vision. Nice. Yeah, that exactly. Everyone has their own. It's funny. Everyone has the unique thing, but it's always there. I this is something I really want to put together and start to collect the whole, you know, maybe swipe file or swipe folder of all these kind of different artifacts and how everyone makes it their own. I, I think people could you do so much with that. But also, yeah, we also one thing to add is we also 
you know, like you said, it's like up until when you everybody is tired and everybody can actually repeat it almost word for word for what the leaders are saying. That's yeah. when you're getting the message across, right? Just having the tool is not enough. We have right. our leader, our CTO, kind of uh, reiterate the uh, the strategy often with our uh, e executive leadership team. We have yeah. multiple layers of the meetings where you know we we have our CTO, myself, and the SLT leadership also talk to the teams very very often about the the vision and what we're working on. And don't forget, kind of this is the vision we we're getting to. The pieces, how does that fit fit in? So it's the the constant kind of communication along with the tooling is very important to get. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely I learned that the hard way years ago that you can't tool your way out of a problem. It can help you, but the tool itself is not going to do anything. So, That's right. Yeah. Um, and and I, I gotta be honest, is there anything better than looking at a checklist or a or a mind map and just seeing all those bubbles colored in or checked and, and just knowing that? <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to make sure you know we're we're running short on time. I I want to make sure you get back to you know your your actual job of delivering great product for the several you know thousand different stakeholders you have over yeah. there. Quick hit, you know, you folks over HG, HGV have, you know, you've acquired a couple of companies, you yourself been on the other side and, and been a company that was acquired, you yeah. know, what in, in 60 seconds or less, you know, what, what kind of tips can you give to someone facing either side of that? Yeah, um, I think it's it's actually when I look across and looking at the industry news too, I've, I've I see that acquisition happens very often now. You know, it's almost like an industry uh, strategy to kind of consolidate and uh, optimize, and then you know make 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 sure we're all kind of stronger on the other end. So being on previous company, we you know I worked on the the new product. Eventually, that led to a successful acquisition. So my company uh, about about a year before I left was success successfully acquired by a bigger company. And and now, like I, you know, we we just dis discussed here, we acquired two pretty decent sized companies um, in the past couple of years. So looking at both and being on both sides, because it's a lot of times it's it's about to out look look at how this the combined team can better perform on the other mm -hmm. end like after the consolidation, and then during the integration process, it's it's common kind of common and hard problem to solve for it. Like we need to figure out how the technology stack and how the team can integrate together. So the one advice I would give to people is like keep an open mind. So mm -hmm. it's often times because the, the, you know, we are very attached and we're very attached and very proud of the product uh, and, and tooling that we use and the product we build. But, you know, being on the uh, acquired side, have an open mind and and suggest solutions to the acquiring company to say, all right, when we look at the holistic problems, here's what I think going forward is, is the best mm -hmm. for, for the combined organization. And then the same thing for the acquiring company. When we acquired another company, it's it like both from a people perspective as well as as well as from a tooling and software perspective, keep an open mind. We will actually have a very holistic and working well together, you know, team and technology stack at the end of it, if we all keep a very open mind and don't be scared, right? Because a lot of times, especially on the car, being a car side, you might say, all right, these people are acquiring us. They might not like the, the technology stack we have. They might not trust what we say, but you never know. Like just, again, keep an open mind, suggest what you think is best for the go forward. And then you know, I think the rest of the tiles will fall in in their in their own place. Makes sense. Uh, well, Nancy, it's been fantastic having you on. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to come sit with us today. Uh, if people want to follow up and ask questions or, or get in touch with you, is there you know LinkedIn or something? Is there a good way to get in touch with you? Yeah, they can search me up on LinkedIn, Nancy Wan at um, HEV. And um, I will be following up on your um, on your blog post as well, if there is one. So I will look at the comments. And I'll answer the comments. I, I would also <laughs> want to find out what people might call my team, right? You know, if, yeah. if, it's, if it's product off square or, or some other name for what they might refer to as my sure. um, team. We'll definitely get that poll up. I'm excited for it. So awesome. Well, thank you so much. And, and it's been a great time. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Please.